We've lost Nick Evers. A quarterback enters the transfer portal. What does that mean for the future of the room? And of course, always more football talk. Welcome to the Bucky Report. Welcome to the Bucky Report, your destination for all things Wisconsin Badgers. Authentic takes. Oh my God. Game analysis. Touchdown, Badgers. Ring one up. And discussion from the fan perspective. Thanks for joining us and on Wisconsin. Welcome to the Bucky Report. We are your hosts, Rajiv and Justin, back together on a Sunday evening to talk about all things Wisconsin, Badgers, football, and a little bit of basketball, but not too much. On today's show, we talk about Nick Evers entering the transfer portal. A once heralded transfer a guy that we got last year is no longer going to be with us. Uh, a few more practices are in the books. We talk about observations that we've read about and some other journalists have written about, how that impacts things, and who were big, our bigger, some of our biggest surprises and who we are pumped about. Uh, we'll do a few recruiting updates. Justin's going to go through a couple evals um, and talk through some, some new offers that we have. And Frankie Fiddler, um, basketball forward out of Omaha, makes his announcement tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. We talk about if, if we think he's coming to Wisconsin and how he can impact the lineup. We are at the Bucky Report on Twitter, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. Um, if you like what we're doing, hit the subscribe button so you know when we make fresh new content. Justin, how was your week? How you doing, my friend? What's going on? I'm doing good, man. I'm absolutely happy with uh, the way spring ball seems to be going, and I am ready for recruiting weekends to start. <laughs> so we get some good recruiting news coming up soon. Don't we ever need it? Don't we ever need it? Um, so yes, uh, Wes Mullinex puts up here. Uh, Justin Rajiv, how are you going to be late to your own show? That's true. We were, we were, I was, this is my fault actually. Justin was here. I uh popped in a bit late, but um, so biggest news of the week, Justin, is of course Nick Evers, um, who we were by the way extremely excited about. Let's let's face it, the physical tools this guy has. I tweeted yesterday about how I just I'm sad that we're not going to get to see these physical tools in Madison because that's the kind of quarterback we were like, wow. You know, Fickle just went out there and got this guy from Oklahoma. You know, he could be the next guy. Either way, he's he's a dual threat quarterback. He's certainly got tons of physical assets. How is he going to fit in? Then last year, we never heard from him. We never saw him. It was really just about Mordecai and Locke. Um, didn't really know what was happening this year in spring. Okay, maybe he's playing a little bit better. And now, unsurprisingly, I think, Justin, he's gone. How do you feel about the loss of Nick Evers? Honestly, I expected it. I figured this is the way it was going to play out. I, I honestly thought if he was not pushing this spring that it made sense for him to, to move on early and find an opportunity where he was going to get a good chance to really push. I don't really know what to make of this from his perspective. I personally think he should drop down to, say, a Mac school or something like that where he's going to get the opportunity to probably have an easier road to starting right off the bat. I think it would be a bad idea to go power five again and get locked in potentially a, a QB battle with a bunch of other guys. It's good to believe in yourself, but I think at this point he needs to just start, in, start putting some film together. The fact that he can transfer whenever he wants, I think it's it would be good for him if he goes down, maybe has two years where he plays really well and then gets the opportunity to jump up for maybe his final year. Yeah, I mean... I agree with you, by the way, about stepping down. I think he needs to get on the field. Like he needs yeah. to get on the field. Right? The guy has been to Oklahoma. He's been at Wisconsin. He hasn't seen the field yet. No one out there really knows what's happening. Is it true that he's going to Penn State? I've seen some comments in here. I haven't heard. I haven't yet. heard anything about it. I follow him. I don't see anything from him on that. If he is, I really like uh, Kotelnicki as a offensive coordinator, and he fits what Kansas quarterbacks were like. But it would be really interesting if that's the case. Like I, I could definitely see Kotelnicki liking him as that, as their type of quarterback, but I would be shocked if it was this quick, unless there was stuff kind of working behind the scenes. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised by that. Anyone put in the comments if, if more of you have heard that, or is that uh, if you see that, let me know. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll pop up the comment here, but I have not, I did not notice that before, but look, I agree. He needs to go to another school where he can get playing time because he doesn't have much longer. I mean, he's gonna. He, he needs to get film, like you said, really quickly. And I do think he's a guy that can be an asset to a lot of teams. Um, I think it's still a loss for us. I, I will say, I, I'm I'm not surprised, but I am a little bit upset in the sense that like we never gave him a chance. We never saw anything that he could do. Obviously, in practices they did. Longo's probably seen what he can do. Fickle's seen it, but I just 
I, I no, there was no package for him. There was no special kind of plays. There was no run fits. There was nothing for him. And that is disappointing because we just don't know what he could have been. Now, again, they, they obviously do, and they were comfortable not giving him playing time. But I'm just sad because we don't get guys with those kinds of tools that often at Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And where could he have fit in? How could he have played with, with TBD and Locke? And, and you know, could he have found a, a season to really get going and start? That's That, to me, is disappointing. Um, but, you know, I mean, it is what it is. Tyler Schreiber has a good comment up here as well. When are these athletes going to handle some adversity? They just transfer now rather than working through things. Just sad to watch. What are your thoughts on that? So I'm just going to flat out say I, I don't agree with that in this particular case. I don't think that Evers was ever going to start here, most likely because I think things were lining up against him, kind of the way things were being set up moving forward. And I think he kind of looked at it and was like, hey, if I don't get it, or if I don't get it this year, if I'm not pushing, it's probably either going to be lock or then I have to worry about Mabry next year. And at that point, you can bet on yourself, but these guys have a limited amount of time to really try. I'm never going to hold it against them to look for an opportunity to actually get on the field and play. These guys, when push comes to shove, the reason why they're playing college football is to play football. They're they're not coming to be part of a roster and practice, you know, nine months out of the year or whatever it is, and burn through college. Like these guys want to play football. So if he's not going to get that opportunity, I can't blame him for looking for a place to to go and play and enjoy it. Not all these guys are going to go to the NFL, but he gets an opportunity to enjoy his college experience as a quarterback. Yeah, I agree with you on that. I, I don't have an issue with it. Obviously, I do think that, that we've, we've said this before. I think there needs to be some kind of controls in place about when you can transfer, how often, how many times you can transfer. There, there, it can't just be a one-year free-for-all, which I don't like about the sport right now. But I do understand because this guy was recruited by Oklahoma. He was recruited by a lot of schools. He went to Oklahoma. He didn't really see the field. He came here, didn't see the field. I get it. He wants to leave. He wants to go somewhere else. Selfishly, I wish he stayed here because, I, again, I, I really think we could have had something with him. But you, you live and you learn and you move on. Looking at the quarterback room, we've got TBD, of course. We've got Locke. We've got Mabry coming in. How do you feel like everything kind of projects now? I mean, did, did you have Evers as a guy that you expected to, to see as a starter at some point? And where does that, where does your room look now? Give me an evaluation. of the So room. we were talking about this kind of in our chat a little bit. And my perspective on this is simply, this is a really interesting situation right now. Because I think that this now leans heavily towards uh, Van Dyke having to be the guy this year. Because if you choose Locke as your starter, odds are Van Dyke is leaving. He's going to transfer out somewhere else where he's going to get an opportunity to start versus just burning his last year here as and not playing. So if he doesn't, then you now have a – or if he starts, you're fine. Your, your quarterback room is probably fine for this year. You have two guys that you're comfortable with and somebody you're high on is a, a third quarterback mm -hmm. in Mabry. If he leaves, now that quarterback room gets really uncomfortable because if you if Locke goes down, you now have a true freshman starter that you have to put out there and nobody behind him. And that is not the room that you want. So if something were to happen there, and people have talked about this a little bit in, in the Discord in Ryan's group, and they're like, well, you have to get a quarterback this year. And I'm like, who are you going to get? Because nobody's going to want to come in to be the backup. That's just not going to happen. Like people want to come and start. You're going to get if you're going to get somebody that's going to come on to just be a body at Wisconsin. They're not going to be good. You might get somebody that has some experience, but they're not going to be anything that's going to help you. Mm -hmm. Which means, you, are you better off playing them over Mabry? I don't know. What are the rules? And I don't know the answer to this. What are the rules about TVD transferring out? Like when can he? How late into the season? Let's let's say you know we we they don't name a starter all of a sudden. First couple of games he's not playing. Can he? Like, wh I don't. I don't actually know the timeline that they have until even to now that he he would technically have started his next year of eligibility. I guess I don't really know. Yeah, I don't know if he'd have to be out at the after spring practice here or what. But maybe that's a conversation that he has with the coaches before that. Or I don't know if as long as you don't play, does oh, I think he used his redshirt year, so he doesn't have that. Yeah, um, I think he. I mean, I don't. I don't think he's going to leave. I think that if they're. I first of all, I don't really think there's a really. A, a, a real competition going on. I think TV. I, I think he's going to be the guy. Yeah. He's going to be the guy. And also, you know, we've heard from, from different journalists that he is beginning to kind of settle in a little bit. Yeah. Obviously he just got here. We're seven practices into the spring. So he's I, doing his job. He is definitely improving. 
But we, you know, Locke is still that guy of the future, I think, at this point. But then you've got Locke and Mabry. You know, you don't have Evers anymore. I'm comfortable with the room. Then you got Little Locke. We'll call him Little Locke, right? Landon Locke coming in uh, in the 25 class. So that's that's obviously good. We could have many years of a Locke starter, obviously. Uh, but Mabry is a guy that we're really excited about. So because we have Mabry and because we have Locke, the other lock, I'm not really that bothered by the room in the sense. I'm bothered because I wanted his skill set in Evers, yeah. but I'm not, I'm, I don't feel like the room took a hit. Now, if you lose Braden Locke, then you have the room has taken yeah. a big hit. If you lose Mabry, the room has taken a big hit because at that point, then you're looking at immediate depth and you're looking at future depth in Mabry. So I do, I'm actually quite comfortable with the room. I don't really have too many concerns about it because. I think, you know, once again, we brought in kind of that one year starter in TVD, um, who, by the way, is also again, he's looking better. He looks like he's making some deep throws and he brings a slightly different skill set than what Mordecai brought. Um, so I think I don't really have too many concerns. Are you are you at all concerned, though, with forgetting the room itself? Just the fact that that we lost the guy that one of Fickle's first sort of big splash guys. I think that kind of like I don't know if it was a long go thing or a fickle thing. It's just it kind of just it's, it leaves a bad taste in my mouth almost because that was one of that guy. That was one of the guys, right, that we were excited about when he came on. And it was like this is fickle making a, a huge impact immediately. Um, not necessarily. I think everyone's kind of feeling out the process of the transfer portal, and a lot of people are realizing that it a lot like high school recruiting, there are hits and misses that you have. I mean, we had that with uh who was the defensive lineman? Uh, this last class, uh, the one from Temple. Um, I can't think of his name. Johnson? Right now. No. Uh, I can't think of it off the top of my head right now. But yeah, he was another guy that we that they brought in that people had high hopes for and just kind of flamed out. Didn't really play. Um, I I honestly don't see a big deal with it. And Varner, yes, thank you, Varner. Yes, Varner. Very good. Um, yeah, so it's it's one of those things where I, I think it's going to be a hit or miss. Like I, honestly, I think looking at the group they got this this cycle has been tremendous. They've done a great job with the portal this this cycle. It looks like, um, but no, not necessarily. So I th one of the things and going back to the room a little bit that I was going to say, I hmm. think what it does do now, if with the way this is playing out, I think you may have to consider grabbing two quarterbacks in twenty twenty five where you just need bodies in that room. And it really depends on what you think Cole Cruz is going to be. Now, he's a guy who hasn't been able to even really practice the last couple of years because of injury. So do you view him as a as a depth piece that you can actually count on, or do you look for somebody else to kind of bring in to fill out that room? Because you're in a tough spot now. You don't want to be going into next year with only three bodies. Yeah, and you can't really build that through the portal, right? Because portal, you're going to get people that want to play right away. So yeah, you, you do got to build exactly. that with recruits. And yeah, I would agree with that. I think that's a fair point. You asked me, you asked that question in our chat yesterday. I never responded, but you're right. I, I agree. It does need to be a two um, quarterback class. But, you know, look, we'll see what happens. Thanks to all of you who are joining us um, in the chat. Um, P says, the year of Kekahuna. We're going to get to, to Tretch Kekahuna here in a second. <laughs> um, Dark Ray says, Evers deserved a chance last year when Locke was averaging five yards a pass with a 50% completion rate. Yeah, look, I mean, I think everyone, we all agree, and Zach Bard says a similar thing, would have liked a Taysom Hill kind of package for Evers, but the writing was on the wall. I just didn't want it to happen given his, given his physical tools. Hope he gets a shot to put it all together. Yeah, like, I, I, I want to see him play somewhere because mm -hmm. I want to just know what we had. And sure, it'll be it'll be crappy if he's really good, but it, I, I'm, I'm really interested to see what he can do because yeah. we were really hyped on him, and I think rightfully so. I don't think we were really overhyping him at all. Um, but um, West Mullinex as well. He obviously was not good enough here in Oklahoma. Do the physical tools blind everybody? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I don't know if we saw enough to really know. Like, and I, I wasn't blinded to the point where I, I had like I thought that he had to be on the field. It was more of a I like the starting point that you have with this guy mentally. If you can get it to click, you're ready to go. Like, I, I don't. There's nothing that I, I know. We've had a few people in the chat say that they would have liked to have seen him given an opportunity with with lock i don't agree on that like if he doesn't know what he's going to be doing out there you can't put him out there it's as simple as that but for packages though like he could have played he could have if, had some if you have a design play but okay so the the issue that you have with that is if that play is if the defense is set up to stop that particular play you need him to be smart enough to know that he needs to check out of whatever you're doing and if he's not to the point where you can trust him to be able to do that 
now suddenly you're burning timeouts. There's all sorts of different things that end up happening potentially. Well, there can be. There, there are ways to kind of make, like you want to make that work, but I just, just think to check you, with you me, need right? to have you're to check with the sideline. Yeah. You're checking with the sideline if you need to. I, I think that like, I am. I'm honestly still shocked that you couldn't get like the, the defenses aren't going to be ready for that. They, they, none of them were been ready for it because they didn't, didn't even see the guy play. I just feel like you could have drawn something up, but maybe it's just that simple that that Longo didn't really see action with him because he wasn't impressed with him in practice. I mean, we don't really know what happened back there. Yeah, uh, but I think ultimately, um, you know, it's it's a bit, bit a bit sad. Noah says TVD still hasn't shown leadership. That's concerning. Um, and dark races ever's had by far the highest potential of anyone in the room, but the QB room is fine. Speaking of the QB room, let's talk spring practice just in a little bit. Um, if you guys don't follow Nick Oson's work, he was with us last week was a really great show. Um, he gave us a lot of good tidbits, uh, things that he's been seeing in practice. He's been going to them, uh, read his stuff on badger 247 too. Like he, he has, he does a notebook after every practice, kind of just unloading his notebook, everything that he sees. And of course there's a ton of other guys out there. Obviously Jesse temple is one of my favorites who I read on the athletic Polzine, whoever you, whoever you like and whoever, whatever journalists you follow, that's great. Uh, you know, get out there and, and read as much as you can about what's happening in spring practice. But the practices have been pretty good, Justin. We're seeing some some nice things coming out of what, I, what I've seen. One of the things that I wanted to talk about right away is the D-line. Nick Oson talked about Willer um, being kind of like an explosive guy, quick, violent hands, seeing some good growth. We've talked a ton about defensive line and how much we need help at that position. It is nice to see. It's early and Certainly I have a tendency to get a little overexcited about what I hear about spring practice because that's just what I do. Uh, but I do like to see that guys like Willer are, are, are getting into the action and actually making big plays and disrupting. I think that's the number one thing that I read on and what Nick wrote and on what Jesse wrote. Disruption by the D-line is something we have been sorely, sorely missing. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see if those guys actually can break through and start getting some reps with the ones. I don't know if that's going to happen, and that's kind of that's what we need to see. Like, if they're only doing it with the, the second team, I, I'm hesitant to give too much credence to it because it's like, okay, uh, is this real or is this kind of one of those things where it's like they're just not really facing anybody on the offensive line and they're so it's hard to take too much away from what they're actually accomplishing now. I think it still holds value. You like to hear, you'd rather hear them making plays than not. So I think that both guys, him and Hills, it's, it's nice to hear that they're being, they're flashing. We need them to continue to flash and hopefully start pushing the guys in front of them. Because I think yeah. there's, there's reps to be taken there for sure. Well, and I think that's what you want, right? You want that competition at those positions, which frankly wasn't there last year because there was no competition behind them, and that really affected their play. There was no competition in a lot of defensive positions, and now there's competition on the D line. There's competition at the linebacker core. So, like, you really can see people. They're gonna you're gonna have to play well if you want to keep your spot. And I love that, right? Every single any single team that you follow, whether whatever sport you follow, competition breeds you know better play that that's just how it is right if you don't have someone behind your back gets ready to take your spot your your play is going to go down a little bit so i think that's a, it's a good point um what else what other big notes i've got a couple things written down here too anything else that you wanted to kind of hit on from spring practice that you've heard and talked about i know you want to talk about tretch maybe this is a good time to do that <laughs> i mean what what can more can be said <laughs> he, he's a dude like i keep saying it and I, i'm higher on this and ryan and i ryan is gonna He's going to feel guilty because Tretch is going to beat 40 catches. It's just going let's to talk about the, Let's talk about this catch situation right now. So you, so you, so yes, we've had a chat with Ryan and, and Justin, I obviously chat quite a bit about this kind of stuff. You say 40 catches for yeah. Tretch Kekahuna next year. I, that is awfully high, my friend, because he does play in the slot. Mind how you, Will catches, Pauling is the best receiver did on Skylar the Bell have? team. How many, how many catches did Skylar Bell have? God, I don't really know. He was did like he 30 35? plus. Something like that, and he was not as gifted as Tretch. It's all about usage, right? I mean, I, I, you're right. Like, look, Tretch, I, I love Tretch. I just feel like, is he really going to get that many opportunities? I mean, you've yes. you've got a pretty loaded wide receiver room. You've got an awful lot of targets for TBD to find. So I you're talking about finding him 40 times. I mean, what did, how, what does that mean for Bryson Green's catches? What does that mean for CJ Williams? What does well, that if you mean think for about it, it's 12 Hall? games. That's less than four catches a game. And I think yeah. he's going to be the safety valve. Because Pauling is going to draw attention, which means that Tretch is going to be left to kind of his own devices to go out there and either beat a linebacker or abuse a 
fourth corner that's out on the field. And that's going to be a problem for any team because Tretch, Tretch is just better than anyone that they have, than anyone's fourth corner, than maybe Ohio State. Tretch does just bring a different level of excitement, I think, yes. to the wide receiver room. And then listen, like, you know, I, I've certainly I've read a lot of people talking about the wide receiver room last year. We were very hyped on it. Yes, we were. Um, and I, I admit that. Yeah. That, yeah. TJ uh, <laughs> says Bell had 15 drops also. Sorry, Raj. Yes, I know. I know. Um, boy, you you stripped down that jersey and like re replayed it with I mean, the I was stuff. at the Purdue game and he. Gosh, if the guy could just catch, he ran pretty good routes. He was in a lot of good spots. He just couldn't get the ball. And Trench I was in that better when he was wide open down the right. Too. Oh, he's killer. a better fit for the other slot spot than than Bell was. He just it, it it's a skill set to a T. Yes, and the way he gets separation, which we've talked about since we since we first saw him on film, he can he's really good at using his body to create separation and to find pockets of space that he can actually get open, show himself to the quarterback and, and make those plays. And it's not like we've been talking about it for a while. You look at any of the journalists that are at practice this week and they're all talking about Tretch Kakahuna, which I love that. I mean, that's exactly what we want to see. Another receiver that they've they've talked a little bit about is KBJ. Do you feel like KBJ gets any time this year? How do you feel like he could fit in, or is he just a guy for the future in your in your? Opinion? I I honestly think that we're looking at him as a. I think he'll get on the field a little bit, but I I would be shocked if he gets more than like six or seven catches. Like he's going to be kind of in that what we saw last year with Burroughs, Tretch, Tretch. No, let's be honest, Tretch would have had more than ten catches last year had he not been injured in fall camp. Like, I think he was dynamic enough that he would have got on the field some, probably would have started. If he would have had fall camp, I feel fairly confident he would have been stealing reps from Bell by midseason. Yeah. Now, we didn't, he didn't get the opportunity to because I don't think he was even eligible. Like, he was not healthy enough to play to like, week four or something like that to even get back out there and start practicing. But, yeah, it's – he's going to be – I would say somebody who's potentially going to get some mop-up duty catches here and there, but mm -hmm. I would not expect him to be anything quite yet. But you're um, still excited about him. Oh yes, yeah. very much. So. Yeah. He, he's you got know, a very uh, interesting skill set and yeah. very good in space like Tretch. Right. Noah says 40 is a lot, but last year, none of our wide, none of our wide receivers could get space. If he's getting space, Easily 40. Noah says easily 40 if he's getting space. Well, he is going to get space because that's just what he does. Yeah. And that he is again, he played at one of the best high school football programs in the country here in Vegas, the Bishop Gorman. So he has played with insane competition. And the fact that he's showing he right now college corners all all that season, his senior season, yeah. he was facing guys that were playing hundred or five or at least group of five. Yeah. No doubt. Mike 78 says they need guys on the outside. Is anyone stepping up? I mean, to be fair, most of the talk that I've certainly read has been with with Pauling and Tretch, but I will say Bryson Green has it sounds like he's looking pretty good. I honestly, Justin, haven't read much about anything about CJ Williams. Have you heard anything I've heard more that about the he's, outside? They said he's taken a step. I, yeah. Longo was very complimentary of him in one of his interviews. I don't know what to make of it because I really don't know what's going on with with it overall and what they're actually practicing on stuff. My gut instinct says they'll be better. I, I don't know what that means. Like that could be, you could have CJ end up getting 450 yards receiving or something like that, which would be a, a big step up. But if he gets that, then you're probably chewing into somebody else's yardage. Cause I think that Tretch probably could be a 500 yard guy this year. Like I think he's going to, he's going to average, he's going to have a decent yard per catch average because I think he's going to be a guy that can get you to 11 or 12. He's not going to probably be like one of those super explosive guys that averages like 18 just because of the way he's going to be used. But I think he can be in that 12, 13 yard range because it's going to be a I lot of like yards to make something happen. I feel like this 40 catch thing is going to be something that, that, that I feel like this but is going to be one of your hot takes that, because if you remember, like you seem very confident about it, which by the way, you were also very confident about Connor season getting 12 minutes in his freshman season. And I thought you were crazy <laughs> as did Ryan. So and you were clearly right about that. So you have a tendency to be right about these like bold takes about these young guys. So we'll see. I listen. I hope you're right because it I, sounds Tretch, like they're really using Tretch a lot in practice. And listen, if you have two slot receivers, staff, receivers very out there, confident about him. I mean, let's go double slot. I'm all for that. I am all for seeing both. Well, they're of those putting guys him in orbit. There. They're putting him in orbit motions. Yeah, you get him with a head of steam coming at the line of scrimmage. 
Love that. Just <laughs> love that. I mean, well, he, he already you, is good. Now you put now you put him in motion. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like he's a guy that I don't think has gotten to the point where you can he can deal with press yet. Now you get him moving with a head of steam towards the line of scrimmage. That's going to be a severe pro. I feel so bad for whoever's trying. You put a safety on him in that situation. You, I'm sorry, dude. You're just, you're getting burned because if you can't get into him, he's going to make you misstep and that's going to cause separation. Uh, you got some people that are really agreeing with you here. Carson Matsky says, I'm with Justin on the over. Dark Ray says, um, we can do jet sweeps again with Gretch. And TJ says, week eight, the bet will be done. Five per game. Wow. <laughs> I mean, geez. I'll take Zach it if Carson that's the case. Says, Tretch, Pauling, and a big body wide receiver like Williams, Green, Burroughs, et cetera, is going to be absolutely lethal. That's the that's the real thing, right? I but again, Green's we had the same the thought last year. year. I think that one of the biggest keys about the wide receiver is going to be Bryson Green because yeah. that's a guy that I'm He's still really high on. From last I mean, year. People forget I've, that he was banged up. Absolutely, he was. And I loved him coming into last year and thought his his impact could be huge. And to be fair, he did have a big impact. You know, he was was he was the second leading wide receiver on the team, right? Um as far Yardage as wise, team, I think he was. I don't yeah, think he was next calling. So but a year of growth and frankly a year of working in Longo's system, I think is going to do him wonders. So you add that on one side and on the outside, whether it's whether it's CJ on the other side or whether it's Vinny Anthony or whoever it is. Or, or Tyrell Henry, by the way, is another, is another one, by the way, who's been showing off um, in practice as well. So I think there is enough depth there to be really excited. Again, once again, I, I'm going to go into the season thinking this is going to be one of the best groups we have on the team. Can they actually show up? You got to think in year two of Longo's system, things are going to be vastly improved. Carson Matsky, odds, odds that we had a boundary receiver in the portal, I would say very low. Um, I don't think there's anybody you're going to snag in the portal that's going to be up to speed fast enough to really steal any reps from the guys that are in there. That room is going to be better than people think it is. Like we saw in the bowl game what it's capable of when everyone starts to click and understand what they're supposed to be doing in this offense. It just took longer than people wanted it to. Now, a lot of it's going to come down to are the quarterbacks able to or are they comfortable? So if, if it's Van Dyke, he's got to be comfortable enough to be timing wise locked in and be able to make the plays. If that's the case, I think the receivers know what they're doing a lot more this year than what they did last year. And that's going to make it far more likely for them to be capable. I think the passing game is going to look much improved this year. Yeah, I agree that they're not going to anyone else. Tyrell Henry is the last. I think that's the guy that they added. That's I don't think he's going to play much this year. And, and he might not, but I don't, but so yeah, I don't think they get any more anymore because you're right. Like, they the, the room wasn't as good as we expected last year, but another year, um, year all, all, all these guys stepping up, more experience, it should be better, and I think it will be better. And frankly, if it's not better, that would be a massive surprise. So yeah, yeah. I think we're, we're we're pretty much locked in where we are. Finishing up quickly on the offense, just talk about a couple other things. Running backs, um, Tawi um, a Walker, just again, no, no, sorry, not uh, yeah, he just could, looks to look looks amazing. He like continues yeah. to be the guy. And Ches Malusi. It's sounding like he's really, really rounding back into form. I mean, I'm, I'm really again, like I said it last week, I'm really excited about the room. I don't really feel like it's that big of a drop off when you when when you you miss Braylon Allen, sure. But Braylon Allen was also a guy that, you know, he was great, but he also had a little injury proneness to him. And Ches Malusi obviously had the freak injuries. Um, he's not really necessarily injury prone, but hopefully he can stay healthy all year. And you got Walker, then you've got a whole litany of guys behind him. So I, I think that we're looking pretty good there. And Walker continues to shine. Yeah, it'll be interesting because honestly, there are several guys that I probably would have flagged as guys as potential transfer targets. The issue is, is that Dupree and Jones didn't come in. So that kind of messes with things a little bit in terms of what guys' perspectives are potentially on their role going forward. And I think that it makes it tougher for that to be a spot, but it feels like there should be guys that are leaving, don't you think? Yeah, no, like, for I, sure. I feel like there's at least a couple. Like I could see it. Acker moving to tight end or like an H back type role and kind of being like a utility knife kind of guy. But I, I just don't know where some of these other guys are going to be. Like I, I, I like Nate white. I want him to be good, but I think he's a weaker version of like a Dupree. And I like, you know, uh, who's the other cat? Um, Cade. Cade. Yeah. Cade Iacomelli. I, I like him, but I don't think he has the upside of like a Dylan Jones or a Dupree. And I think that that's what hurts them. Like those I mean, you guys are got... being like all conference type guys. 
Right. I mean, you've literally got, of course, you've got Chaz and you've got Walker. Then you've got Atuka, who looks like he's having a good spring. Then yeah. you've got Jones and Dupree. Like, you've got five guys right there that you're like, yeah, we've got five guys who can be really good running backs for some, for some amount of time, especially with the young guys like Jones and Dupree. But you're right. I mean, Nate White, Kate Giacomelli, I, mean, I don't think they're really going to find their place, which is which is okay. That's that, And that's I think Cade would find a role someplace where he could be a good back for another team. Like, I just don't think that he's a fit necessarily for what Wisconsin needs, which yeah. is they need somebody dynamic and somebody that has a, a really high upside at that position. Uh, one more quickly on offense. Zach Bart says, sounds like young freshman O-line have impressed in spring ball. Justin, Colin Cubberly, can, his name continues to pop up. I am. I have to tell anyway, you, I'm surprised by that. I'm surprised by that. I did not really expect Cubberly to come in and make immediate impacts. He looks like he's going to maybe advance into the two deep, maybe in the fall. We'll see how that goes. Spring balls can be different, but it's nice to see that depth because we've talked a lot about how we've got those that front five kind of set right now, the first five. But then behind him, there's a lot of question marks. You've got young guys like Kevin Haywood, who we're obviously very high on. But it's nice to see that Cubberly's making some some strides. Yeah, I I actually think that he he actually projects really well as a as a center for them. Uh, I, I actually prefer that over him potentially being a guard or tackle, um, where some people have thought about him. I think Haywood obviously I think is is a great fit for a tackle. Oh, yeah, he's definitely uh, the issue I have is that you need to find some guys in the portal because I don't think the outlet, well I, I think it's really nice that these guys are flashing a little bit. I don't think they're, they're to the point you can rely on them if something happens in your season hinges. You don't want to be hinging on Haywood as a true freshman tackle against Bama or against USC or Penn State or Oregon later in the season. It's like this, those are teams that you cannot afford to have him being out there on an island against elite athletes. Now, I think in a year, maybe two years, he's he's going to be really adept at that. But I think right now you want to have somebody with some experience that you can bring in and, and can take that role. It's kind of the same with an interior guy. I think, honestly, if, if in the portal, I think we are going to be somewhat active. And I would be shocked if it's not like a guard center kind of guy and then a, a tackle. Because I think they just need depth in terms of like the second group where you have a couple of swing guys that you're like, I need somebody that I can plug in if somebody goes down. Yeah, I, I hear that. But the thing about the portal is you, you, you these guys want to play. It's hard to get guys in the portal that are going to be like cool with just being like, yeah, you're going to really kind of help fill out the two deep. Well, I don't, yeah. you know, I mean, we'll see. We'll see what we can get out of the portal, but it's fair. Well, I mean, if you're getting in the rotation, I don't necessarily think that's a problem. And I think some of those guys would like if you bring in a swing tackle and a, a swing guard, they're probably going to play some. It's just, yeah, you're, you're looking probably at an eight, eight, eight rotation, right? You're going to have a lot yeah. of people moving. You want three guys that can keep people fresh. You're probably not going to see a lot of time at center. And Renfro, by all accounts, is just dominating right now in spring ball, which is Please great. Please stay healthy. Please yes. stay healthy, Jake yeah. Renfro. We need those snaps. We need everything that yep. you're doing. He, look, we know that guy's talented. So let's just hope he, he can stay healthy. On the defensive side of the ball, I'll turn it over to you and see what, what you want to talk about here with defense. But for me, two guys that I've, I'm really glad are popping is Sebastian Cheeks. Heard a little bit about Cheeks now, which is nice to see. And of course, Christian Allegro, who's no surprise there. And we continue to hear more about Braden Moore, which is nice uh, because we need him. We need someone to kind of fill out that defensive back a little bit. And he brings a little power. He's hitting well. So that's nice to see. But I, I'm happy to hear about Cheeks. Every single time you look at anyone's write-up of practice, they're talking about the linebackers. It's great to see because mm -hmm. there's so many people. And you're gonna have you we spoke earlier about competition. Boy, there's an awful lot of competition for these spots. There's there's gonna be four or five of guys, these guys on the field, and I don't know who they're gonna be, but I know there's gonna be a lot of people behind them working as hard as they can to work into that starting lineup. So Again, we're just going to see a lot of good things coming out of linebacking. It's not even just that. It's the fact that there's no athletic drop-off, at least in the middle guys at all. Like I, the, the worst athlete out of the group is Cheney, who by all accounts is not a slouch. But you have Thomas, you have Tackett, you have Sebastian, Allegro. you have Allegro, you have Cheney. That's five guys that are all – plus athletes at that position. <laughs> so you're like, you could keep those guys fresh and keep them moving around and not have to worry about it. And I think they will probably rotate somewhat with those guys. Now I think the top guys are probably going to be Tackett and, and Thomas. I think Cheney is going to probably be borderline a starter too. Like there's going to be a lot of rotating going on um, outside guys. I think it's going to be Lowry and probably Pius 
to start, but I think that that's going to be a split too. Like it's going to be a very situational dependent uh, with a lot this season. And it sounds like Witten and Peterson might be the best against the run. So I think there's a lot to be excited about in terms of that group, which was kind of a major weakness this last season. So to hear them take a step forward and yeah, I hearing about Braden Moore is a big deal because Latou was kind of a problem for part of the season last year where he missed a uh, ton of tackles and took a, bad, a lot of bad angles. And if Moore is probably a better athlete, gives you someone to push him on the back half to potentially take that spot, I'm all for it. I want us to have a capable backup if he's not playing up to snuff. God, some of those missed tackles were so ugly last year from Latou. <laughs> We were struggling to stop the run as it was and to have him out there and just absolutely butcher some of his his angles and, and just miss tackles badly was just brutal. It's funny when you talk about, you know, like the athleticism in the linebacker room. It's Cheney and these other four guys you mentioned. Well, it's like none of those guys were here last year. The entire room is more athletic than our entire room last year by far. I mean, obviously, Cheney's really the one guy who's going to be there. And Allegro was great last year, but he only played a very little bit near the end of the season. Didn't really get as many minutes as he's going to get now. So, yeah, I mean, there is just an endless supply of, of goodness. And and I will say, hearing good things about Niger Forkerin, like that, that's cool. I don't love, but I do. I'm, I'm all for him being great. <laughs> Cornerback um, room is going to be a strength this year. Yeah, you know it because you know you got Rico and I think RJ Delancey looks like a guy. He Same looks like Delancey. a guy. I think the starters are probably going to be Delancey and Enrico on the outside. And then you'll probably have right. Brown in the at slot or uh Jace Arnold or Max Laffey. Yeah. You got a lot of depth situation. there too. I mean, with because yeah. listen, I mean, obviously does play well, and you've got you've got a lot of people back there. You got DeCluna. I mean, you've, you've got people that can actually fill that out a little bit yeah. and well, and you're good, gonna but... face teams that are gonna go four wide. Like Oregon's gonna go four wide. You're definitely gonna see it from USC. You're gonna see it from Bama probably a ton. So these guys are gonna get on the field. Yeah, I think from a coverage perspective, we're gonna we're gonna be okay and good. I worry you do I do like you mentioned with Latou, I worry about missed tackles with these guys. Yeah. I don't know how good we're gonna be at tackling, but this is gonna be a problem. Like teams are teams last year really took advantage of the fact that we didn't have a lot of good tackling in the secondary. And other than Wooler, because look, we know Wooler's always gonna be there. Yeah. He's always gonna be the guy. But if Wooler can't make the play, someone's gonna have to, whether it's Latou or Moore or the quarterbacks, we've got to make sure um that, that we can do that. TJ says, did Latou learn how to wrap up? Let's hope. Let's hope. I mean, my goodness. Carson says, wasn't just Latou. Watch Watch Chubba Purdy ran 55 yards in one play for Nebraska over our linebackers. Yeah, there. Listen, we had a lot of issues last what year. Um, who would the other uh, middle linebacker that left for Michigan State? He's still trying to chase Chuba Purdy down and and not being able to catch him. Good lord! <laughs> I the, the angle that he took in that game, watching him get run past, I'm like, what is going on? Yeah, it was. Uh... A little, a little gnarly. Justin, anything else on Turner. spring football? Any other notes that? Yeah, it was Jordan Turner. Any other notes that you um, have from the spring that you wanted to bring up? No, I mean, I, I, we're we're almost halfway through. This is where I start. I think people are going to start to separate themselves. We all the implementation is done. Now you're just kind of fine tuning things and working through it again. And I think that this is where we'll really hear people get comfortable. And we're we're going to start to hear the performances pick up in the second half of this. That's going to kind of get the the fall depth chart set up after this. So there's a lot to be done here that I think is going to really help this. Hopefully the defensive line takes a step. I believe in Whitlow. I think he's capable of getting these guys to play incrementally better than what we were last year, which I think will help a lot, especially with the linebackers being a lot better. So I think the defense has a chance to to take a a bigger step than what we expected. And I thought that they would be better, but I think athletically it seems like there's a lot that's coming together on that side in terms of guys potentially making splash plays, which is something we really struggled with last year. Yeah, no doubt. We definitely need to make those splash plays and disruptive plays. We've got to be back to ourselves, of our the Wisconsin way of being a disruptive defense that our people are frankly scared to play against, which, which would be really great. Uh, we a couple more topics to talk about today. We're going to do some recruiting updates, and then, of course, we're going to talk quickly about Frankie Fiddler's announcement tomorrow. Let's talk recruiting a little bit, Justin. We've got some new offers out there, guys. You wanted to talk about um, if you don't follow Justin on Twitter at Bucky Report JJ, he does some good evals 
um, of his own um, on um, on Twitter, where he talks about you know obviously gives you the the important information. Uh, I do. You, are you still doing a Badger um, like a, a likeness comp? Yep. Yeah, Badger comp. Yeah, All three of them have it. Um, <laughs> So, Javen Gordon, let's start with Javen Gordon, running back, um, 5'10", 195 out of Georgia. What do you like about this guy? Yeah, he's – the way I kind of put it with him is he's kind of a jack-of-all-trades, master of none kind of back. He's really – he's got a lot of things he's good at. I don't know if there's anything that I look at with him that I'm – that I'd say he's great. Like, he doesn't necessarily have top-end speed. He's not a guy who's super elusive. What he is is a guy that has pretty good vision that has a good one step and go and he does not hesitate when he goes and he despite the fact that he is aggressive when he runs he's patient he's not a guy that i look at that just runs blindly up the back of people to get to something he's he seems to have an idea of what he's doing out there um i comped him to Corey clement i don't think i don't know if he's got quite the elusiveness that clement has but when i looked at him from a standpoint of some of the things he does I think they run pretty similar. He's pretty slippery. Guys tend to hit him and they just kind of slide off. He doesn't go down very easily. And that's kind of the thing that him and Clement, I felt like were pretty, pretty comparable on. They're both run hard and they, they can take a little bit of punishment and kind of keep their legs driving. Um, but I think that there was enough elusiveness there and that I think that he's got, he's got some ability to hit a seam and, and break off some chunks. I just don't think he's a home run hitter. I agree. He's not really a home run hitter. And that's kind of what I noticed. I'm a little worried about his size. He's a little undersized, right? I mean, 5'10, 195. He looks small. I think small he can get him at 215. There. I think he, he can. I, I just worry about when you, when you go up against Big Ten D lines and linebackers, I feel like he might struggle. He's finding those holes. All right. Like, look, he, he clearly had played with a really good O line. Like, you, when you watch this guy's film, like his O line, they were pulling guards and tackles all over the place, really had some good blocks. Now, he did run hard for sure. I didn't see anything that really like struck me as okay. This is the kind of guy. I mean, who knows, right? We'll see. We'll see how he goes and and what what how he develops. But I'm a little concerned about his size overall, just because I don't know how that really translates when you move it into the Big Ten. But I will say you need to look at Jones and Dupree as comps in that regard, and they were both listed at 180 pounds on their profiles. So I think it's I think it's the way that they ran though. Like they looked, they felt bigger when well, they when you watch, their skill sets were exactly were, like when when I when I watch a guy like Gordon, I'm not I'm not blown away. Like when I watched Jones and Dupree, I was blown away. I was like, okay, they they've they've yeah. got vision that's next level. Now I will say Gordon does have really good vision. You you called that right. I agree with you on that. But I just he he's gonna get look hit. like he's got the physical tools. Exactly, yeah, he's gonna get hit more. He's not a, he's not capable of of eluding guys quite like those two are. Right. I, I do think that he finds space pretty well, but I'm not. He's a guy who I could see being like we talk about all the time. What I think that a back should average in this offense, and I've said before, I'm like I there's certain guys I think will be six plus. I think Dupree and Jones are the type of guys that can be six plus yards per carry guys. I would say this is more like a five and a half guy. He's going to be five, five and a half, and he's going to be a guy that runs well for you, but isn't necessarily going to bust off a bunch of big runs that are going to drive up that average. Yeah. Yeah, when I look at the the running back room and I get think about the people that I want in there, and I look at, I remember being really excited about Nate White too. We haven't even seen the guy f- play yet. So mm-hmm. I just feel like he's likely someone who will get lost in the shuffle a little bit. But nonetheless, we'll see what it is. Well, that's why I look at this. I think Gordon's more of a depth piece. Like yeah, he's, sure. he's a guy 100%. who I think that you're, you're not going to be broken hearted if you have to put him out there on the field. He's going to give you good reps because I think he does a little bit of everything and he does it well. Yeah. Uh, wide receiver Davion Chandler. Let's talk about him uh, out of Lawrence North in Indianapolis, a school that I'm familiar with. It's not too far from where I grew up. Six foot 170. What are some of your thoughts on Davion Chandler? I think that he's very explosive. He's a guy who it has some good elusiveness to him. He is an outside guy. Um, I mean, he oh, averaged very much like so. 25 yards a catch. And he's a guy that you watch his initial acceleration, and he is really quick off the line. Um, he's a guy that really explodes when the ball is snapped. Um, I I like how he moves on people. He just has a knack for under, like he has a good feel for around himself and finding space. You'll see him catch the ball and he'll just kind of have these subtle moves that he makes that separate him from people that I just think is kind of a sixth sense that receive, good receivers have. And I think that that's something that carries over for him, like to the college level. He's going to have a knack for kind of just, understanding how to find that extra five yards on a catch. I actually think he's got a lot of upside in terms of physical development. 
Uh, he's got some of his lift total or uh, numbers listed on his profile and huddle, which are going to go up a ton when he gets into the college strength and conditioning. I think there's a gear yet that he can find. He's got a four, six time listed for his 40 time. I think that's that he looked that looks slow compared to his film. I actually think he's, he looks like a four or five guy now, but I think there's a gear that he's going to find when he gets developed, that he's going to be a guy who can be a four, four type guy when he really gets into a strength, strength and condition program with his acceleration. Yeah. Um, I like Chandler quite a bit. Actually. I like his film. I think that he Good has body control. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what I was going to say. The body control. And it's, it's actually about like, he's very instinctual. And I think that when you, when you see a guy that just has physical tools from the receivers, and you watch their film, it's about how they adjust to the ball in the air. And, and like you said, finding space and being able to make catches that are difficult. And he does that well. Mm -hmm. You know, he's constantly, he plays with his head up. He's constantly looking around. He understands where the defenders are, where to create that space. And then he can make a play. I mm -hmm. think of it, I, I remember it's when I, when I think back to watching Bryson Green, I feel like I, it, he reminds me similar to that, like an outside guy that can high point the ball and can just make a play because mm -hmm. It, when when you, you when you're looking at film of all these different guys and all the different offers that we said that we send out right like it's it's fine but you've got to look for these tiny little things of separation and Chandler to me has a little bit of that separation it's not just about I'm quick I'm getting open he's actually making plays and you can see that and and he's got a pretty decent offer list a lot of max schools um, IU of course because it's in Indianapolis Louisville a lot of Midwest schools there uh, but yeah I, I think I'm excited about him and Lawrence North puts out really good athletes so that that's that's uh I comp to, be win for us. to Nick Toon Nick Toon okay very good I actually felt like that was a good one based off of what he looks like now, right now yeah. I think he's got more I think he's got more upside speed wise than what Toon did I think Toon never became much of a blazer I think this guy has a cape there's there's a chance he finds an extra gear and can really run by people by the time he leaves college yeah yeah uh, the other one we wanted to talk about uh, was Elliot Shaper, linebacker out of Westlake, a football heavy school in Austin. I really like this guy. I think that he's <laughs> very instinctual. He plays downhill. He's a he's a hard hitter. When I watch this guy's film, same kind of thing. There's he has that little X factor for me that you can see translate to the next level because his vision hitting those holes is really good. He can chase down the play, and I love the aggressiveness that he plays with a little twitch, a little bounce right off the bat. Um, and you know, he can definitely play that downhill thing. But to me, it's vision and instincts that you see right away uh with Elliot Shaper. I'm gonna lead with my comp on him right away. It was Jack Sitchie. And I said that because of the fact that you can see the fact. He understands very, very well how to time his blitzes. There's so many times where he takes that step forward and he times it with the snap so well to get ahead of steam coming downhill, but that the offensive lineman doesn't really have time to adjust to him and that he puts himself in a spot to go unblocked. And he ends up in the backfield just terrorizing things. Uh, the only knock I really had on him in my eval was I don't see him dropping in space very much on his film. He's very much attacking downhill a lot. He is a guy who does not, hesitate like he'll he trusts his instincts like inherently you can see it he will take like a beat he sees something and he just goes mm -hmm. every time it's there's no hesitation just downhill and there's a ton of plays where he's just blowing stuff up or making yep. a quarterback super uncomfortable and he's a really good athlete like you watch him move he's he flows well he's yeah, a he guy moves well laterally too yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. good lateral movement so he's a yeah, guy. I, I think he, him, and Ains, Brandon Ains, were are very similar in that regard. Although I think Ains shows a little bit more in terms of being able to work in space. But I like them both. I think both these guys are capable of just making a tackle miserable if they come downhill off them. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Uh, good recruiting nuggets, and definitely keep keep following Justin on Twitter. Um, Bucky Report JJ at Bucky Report JJ for his recruiting evals. I want to talk about Frankie Fiddler. Um, Frankie Fiddler. We're going to switch to basketball. This is the first time I brought it up since the tournament, Justin. It's, it's okay. okay. You can, you can it do it now. <laughs> uh, Frankie Fiddler is um, a forward 6'7", 205 out of uh, Omaha, who's making his announcement tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Um, 8 a.m. Central Time on some local station um, in Omaha. Um, I really like him. I really like him because I feel like he's a guy – that can find ways to score. He can shoot the three well. He has a good mid-range game, and he's a guy that controls his body well. Um, you know, he shoots the fadeaway. We need a guy that can put the ball on the floor and make and create his own basket. Now, he, he did it in Omaha. I'm not saying he's going to be as effective doing doing the Big Ten, but 
when you lose a guy like AJ Store, we're going to need to add people in the portal. We're going to need to add people at that position. So I like what I see out of him because he's a pro prolific is a strong word, but he's a very good scorer who can who knows how to take really good shots and he's and he's just a guy that has really good control of his body and can create shots, which I like to see. He shoots three-pointers coming in right off the, you know, from step and shoot. He's got he can decent moves off the dribble. You get him in the post, he can fade away, he can do things. He's a multi-dimensional scorer, which frankly is someone that we were ne it's necessary. Now, what I don't know, I tried to watch a little bit of it. Doesn't look like he's a great defender, but I, I think he's going to be better than AJ Store was. Do you think he gets in the lineup? What do you think about him? Do you think I by, by the way, I think he is coming here because the relationship that he has with Chucky Hepburn. Um, he has Nebraska, uh, Creighton. Michigan State and Wisconsin are his final four. Um, you oh, it is. You think it's Creighton? I don't think it's Creighton. I, I don't know. I don't think anybody has a, a feel for this because I know Nebraska was on the list too. And reading and up the info State, that yeah. I found them, they basically said I don't. They they're not even sure Fiddler knows who where he wants to go. Um, it's interesting because I think that when it, whenever it comes to this, there's always a chance that he just is wants to stay home. Like there's a risk here with two teams being in his state that he very much could be like, you know, I get to finish off my career with family and friends watching me play all the time. And that can be a really big pull. Now, Chucky is somebody who I definitely do think has a pull. Nebraska has one of his former high school teammates also on that team. And then Creighton obviously is the, the money of everybody. Like they have the biggest NIL and they're a really good program. So I don't want to do a disservice to them by saying it's a money thing because they're probably the best team in terms of like what their expectations are next year out of the group. We've got money to burn too. We've got, we've got money that we can offer Fiddler. I think that, I mean, he's certainly one of the top targets that we have. Do you, if he, if he ends up coming here, Justin, do you think he'd be a good addition to the, to our lineup? Well, yeah. I just, I've, I've always thought that he would be a solid addition. I just don't necessarily know. Like he's, he's not enough. Like there needs to be more than him. And I think that with, store leaving we're in a bind kind of athletically now where fiddler doesn't fix that like he's not an athlete that you're bringing in you need to find somebody who can create their own shot and he might be able to do it through some of the things he does but you need somebody who athletically can go out there and get a shot like you, we don't really have anybody on the roster you're not going to rely on free tag as a true freshman to come in and be that guy Fair. He, way too much pressure on him Fiddler's not not athletic though. I mean, I agree. No, he's I, not. It's well, just he's, he's, he's not. Some he's not going to. He's not going to out athlete Big Ten wings. Like he's not going to. He's not going to be taking down guys that are that are playing small forward in the Big Ten, athletically. He's going to get yeah. it by skill. So it's he's he's not a guy that I would I want having to find a way to get that shot late in the shot clock where store could do it just because, Hey, I can go past this guy or I can, I can create some natural separation based off my athletic ability. I don't know. Fiddler's going to have to be one of those shot fake type guys and find, you know, he's going to need some help to be able to create those situations where his store could just kind of do it on his own. Mm -hmm. Zach Bart says, I believe he'll follow Hepburn since he's close to Chucky, but I also can't throw away the homeschool vibe. Here's my thing about the homeschool vibe. He's been playing in Nebraska, Omaha. He's already been playing in Nebraska. Like he's, I think he's probably okay with leaving Nebraska now because if he hasn't, if he had not been playing in Omaha for the last couple of years, I would say, yeah, he's probably going to go to Creighton or Nebraska, mm -hmm. but he's already been there. It's not like he, he, he needs to play necessarily in Lincoln. Like I think it's, I don't really, I don't really buy the home thing so much because he's already been there. I, I do think he ends up leaving and, and, and hopefully coming to us because I think he is an addition to the lineup. Um, we're going to need that. We're going to need some forward depth there. He probably play, he's going to play the three. So, I mean, at least I think, I, I feel like he fits in well with the team, but you're right about the athleticism. That is a, that certainly is a concern. And then I think, honestly, it's just a matter of now, if, if they don't get him, what, how does that reflect on guard? Cause now you're, now you're in a bind. If you miss on him, you're probably looking at Brandon Angel from from Stanford as your backup, which he was. He's a different spot, but that's a guy you have to get now. You can't afford to have him go somewhere else. And I don't think he's necessarily a lock. I think Duke or Carolina or somebody was coming after him. So there's there's a blue blood I know that was on the on the board for him that was potentially taking a look at him. That's a problem for Wisconsin. 
Like we can't afford to miss on both those guys being our top board targets and expect to go into next season and having a, a really good season because I do think some guys will take a step forward, but losing an athlete like store really puts a lot more pressure on everybody else to do things that they're maybe not comfortable with. Yeah, this is a pretty big offseason for Greg Gard. There's no doubt about that. We've talked about that a fair amount. I mean, he needs to he needs to fill out this roster and he needs to do it better than he has in the past. He did well last year um, in the portal with with obviously with Store. And I think that when you lose Store, you lose a CGN. I mean, you know, you you've you've got uh, some ma- major holes to fill. We've talked about wings. We've certainly talked about five. You know, you've certainly got to have some some depth in the front court. I mean, so I yeah. He has to make moves. This is a big offseason for Greg Gard, and I am confident that he will get somebody and something. So we'll see what happens. And hopefully it it you know fills out and, and makes the lineup a little better than it was and makes hopefully Justin a little happier about basketball because he's pretty unhappy about basketball these days. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll see if I can get back into the right frame of mind come next season. <laughs> Justin, final thoughts before we close today's show. Um, we're coming up. Honestly, the end of this next month, we're going to start having the official visits. Mar- May 31st marks our first weekend of it. Hopefully starting to get some good news there. Hopefully we just get some good vibes coming up here soon with a couple of people that will end up committing to us in the next you know, month and month and a half. And that gets us kind of headed right back in the right direction. I know people are getting frustrated. We've had some bad luck with a couple of decommits. I think we'll get things moving back in the right direction. I do have a lot of confidence in this staff, and I think this class is actually going to be really good whether the site rankings show it or not based off the film I've looked at the guys we're targeting. I'm very confident in what they're looking at. I think they're going to have a really good class from an athletic standpoint. Yeah. They have a profile of what they want and they're filling it out. They're actually doing what they need to do. Unlike the last recruiting department when the Paul, the Paul Christ era, who you never really knew who they were going after, what kind of profile they were going after. You didn't really ever, you ever couldn't really ever tell. Now you can see the athleticism and and the kind of players they're looking for at all the different positions. So mm-hmm. it is exciting with this staff, no, no doubt for sure. Um, so we did a two deep before spring football. We're going to do another one at the end of spring football to see what changed. I'll actually, I'm going to watch that show again and write down what we had so that we can talk through that a little bit. Um, and then going in, going forward after spring football, certainly recruiting news that Justin will do every week. And we'll kind of do some fun things, uh, some look backs to the fo- the seasons and some rankings, things like that, that we'll add um, during this off season time. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks. We had over a hundred people watching live. Thank you all for joining us. And if you watch this later, um, we appreciate all the support subscribe if you haven't already so that, you know, we make new content. Um, Thanks for joining us and on Wisconsin. On Wisconsin. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy the show, subscribe to our YouTube channel at The Bucky Report or The Bucky Report Podcast from wherever you get your content. Until next time, on Wisconsin. Wisconsin.